Welcome to today's video. Get ready to dive into the chilling world of the paranormal with four terrifying ghost stories shared by certified nursing assistants. These are the real life experiences of those who work closely with the elderly and have witnessed things that go beyond explanation. Whether you're a believer or a skeptic, these tales from the nursing home will make you question what lies beyond. So, turn down the lights, sit back, and prepare to be haunted by stories that may just keep you up at night. Story number one. I am a certified nursing assistant, CNA. When we first arrived in the US in 2003, I was too old to attend high school. So I enrolled in an adult school, and after I completed it, I went to a community college. After four years, my English had improved, and I enrolled in a CNA program. We practiced our skills at a small nursing home. Sorry, I can't mention the name or location of the nursing home. However, I remember the first day we went there. Upon opening the door and entering the nursing home, I thought I heard cows crying and screaming. But it wasn't cows. It was the sick and elderly residents making those sounds. At that moment, I felt like I was in hell, and I thought that in hell, these are the kinds of cries and screams you'd hear. Sorry, I don't know why I thought that at the time, but it was the first thing that comes to my mind. That day, we were helping at the nursing home. We bathed the patients, fed them, and changed them. Every time we went there, the nurses and CNAs liked me because I always helped out and made sure the patients looked very nice. It feels rewarding by going above and beyond to make these patients look nice and comfortable. Toward the end of the CNA program, the director of nursing at that place hired me based on the recommendations of the CNAs and nurses that works there. It was going to be my first job. At that time, CNAs still earned around $2 to $3 more than the minimum wage, so it was a good paying job too. When I first started the job, I worked the night shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. They were going to train me for six weeks before putting me on my own. I remember my first encounter with the unknown. It was my fourth night, and the CNA training me was Amy. Amy was studying to become a nurse. She had been working there for many years and chose to work at night because it was slower, giving her time to study for her RN classes. I remember it was 2 a.m. when a patient passed away. The patient's name was Laura. Her family had been waiting for her to pass, but she wouldn't let go. Around midnight, all the family members said their goodbyes to Laura and went home. Then at 2 a.m., Laura passed away. Amy asked me if this was my first time experiencing a death, and I told her it was. She said she would teach me and told me not to be scared because the deceased know we're just there to help, so they won't try to do anything to us. I remember helping Amy clean up Laura. We washed her, removed her clothes, brushed her hair, and cleansed her skin with warm water and soap as if she were still alive. Once we had her ready, Amy told me to go to the storage room and get the body bag. I took off my gloves, left the room, and walk down the hallway to the storage room at the end. When I opened the door, there was an elderly lady, about 60 years old, in the room wearing a blue dress. She had a white cloth that went under her chin and was tied on top of her head. She looked at me, handed me the body bag, and I took it back to the room where Amy was waiting. Amy opened the plastic bag, and inside was a white body bag along with a long white cloth and some tags. Amy put the patient's name and ID number on a tag and tied it to Laura's right big toe. Then we rolled Laura to the side, placed the white bag underneath her, and rolled her back into the bag. After that, Amy took the white cloth and wrapped it from under Laura's chin to the top of her head, tying it securely. I asked her what the cloth was for, and Amy explained that it was to keep the mouth closed. Seeing this made me scared. Who did I see earlier in the storage room? And how did she know I was there to get the body bag? 
And why did she have a similar white cloth that went under her chin and tied at the top of her head like Laura? After that, the morgue transporter came to pick up Laura. Once the body was removed from the room, Amy and I went to lunch. During lunch, I asked Amy who the older lady working with us that night was. She asked, What older lady? I explained to Amy what I had seen, and she said, Oh, you must have seen Sally. She used to work the night shift as a CNA for a long time. She worked here for almost 30 years until she got breast cancer. Sally ended up at the hospital. Then the hospital sent her here on hospice, and she died about six years ago. Some of the night staff say they still see her sometimes in the parking lot or walking in the dark hallway. Amy saw tears in my eyes. Then she laughed and told me not to worry. Sally doesn't hurt anyone. I asked Amy if she had taken care of Sally when she was dying. Amy told me that she was the one who performed Sally's post-mortem care. She even tied the white cloth around Sally's head, just as she had done with Laura. Story number two. My name is Mai. I used to work as a certified nursing assistant at a small nursing home. Those of us who work in these places often experience strange and eerie encounters. Perhaps it's because nursing homes are often the last stop for many of the elderly who can no longer care for themselves and come to stay until they pass away. There was an elderly granny who was transferred from the hospital to our nursing home because she had developed pressure ulcers on her buttocks. When someone is bedridden for too long without proper care, their skin can start to break down, especially if they are left lying in urine and feces for extended periods without being changed. When the hospital admitted this granny, they had already filed a case with Adult Protective Services. The hospital staffs could see the severity of her wounds and reported the situation to APS, I thought to myself that many people might not know how to properly care for someone who has had a stroke. They might not realize that if you don't regularly turn a bedridden person, they can develop bed sores. This granny and me are the same race and ethnicity. Therefore, whenever I was on duty, they would assign this granny to me. I worked the evening shift from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. While I was caring for her, I noticed that her family didn't visit her often. When they did, it was usually a quick visit before they left. This granny had suffered a stroke, so her left arm and leg were paralyzed. She could feed herself with her right hand, but she needed help with everything else, like changing clothes or getting cleaned up. I told her several times that if she needed help, she could press the red call button. But whenever she knew I was working, instead of using the button, she would call out loudly, My, my, I'm hurting. My, come help me. She continued doing this until the day she passed away. She was only there for seven months. When she died, many relatives came to see her and dressed her in traditional funeral attire. I'm not sure if these relatives knew that her immediate family rarely visited her. That same week on a Thursday night, I was at work. Around 8.30 p.m., I had put all of my patients to bed and was on my lunch break. After my break, I checked on my patients, and they were all sleeping. When I went to the nurse's station, the nurse said to me, My, I swear I heard the granny calling for you, just like she used to, while you were on lunch. The nurse wasn't joking. She seemed genuinely serious. As she told me this, she showed me her arms, which were covered in goosebumps. I reassured her that she was probably just imagining it, because we were so used to hearing that granny call for me. By this time, an elderly Hispanic man had already taken over the room where the granny used to stay. That night, my shift ended at 11 p.m. I gave a report to the next CNA who would care for my patients until 7 a.m. Once I finished everything, I left the nursing home and walked to the parking lot. I was alone, and the nursing home was near a large grape farm. As I was unlocking my car door, I heard the grandma's voice calling, My, I'm hurting. I opened my car door, trying to convince myself that I was just hearing things. But then, I felt a sensation like ants crawling all over my body, though I knew it was just my hair standing on end. 
Then I heard her voice again. My. I quickly got into my car and drove home. I never mentioned this to my family or my parents. The next morning, my father had already left for work, but my mother told me that both she and my father had heard a woman's voice calling my name outside the house the previous night. That's when I told my mother what had happened. My mother believed that because I had been the one caring for the grandma, perhaps she didn't realize she had passed away and followed me home. Since the funeral hadn't taken place yet, maybe that's why she was still lingering. After that strange night, I didn't hear anything else. I guess when the family held the funeral that weekend, she finally left this world. You might think that, because we work in healthcare, we don't believe in these things. However, even the nurses and many doctors who work in nursing homes believe that ghosts and spirits exist. Long-term nursing home is like a last stop for many patients. But as far as I know, these spirits have never harmed anyone. Thank you. Story number three. I worked as a CNA in a nursing home for four years, and there were a lot of ghostly and spiritual encounters during that time. Many of us experienced strange things. Some elders had lived there for many years before they passed away. These are the ones who, even if they died at the hospital, would still somehow find their way back. There was an old man named Frank who had lived in room 12 for a long time. He was a wealthy man and didn't want to share his room with anyone else, even though this nursing home typically had two patients per room. Frank was also a longtime smoker, so he would often go out to the patio at the back of the nursing home to smoke in the designated smoking area. I remember one day, I arrived at work at 3 p.m., and the paramedics were there, loading Frank into an ambulance and taking him to the hospital. When I got inside, I asked the CNA who worked the morning shift what had happened to Frank. She told me that Frank had suddenly started vomiting blood and couldn't breathe. It was strange because just yesterday, he seemed fine and was still smoking outside on the patio. That night, after I had put all of my patients to bed, I went to the nurse's station to do some charting. Suddenly, the call light in room 12 came on. I thought to myself, what the heck? No one should be in that room. Frank is still at the hospital. Even the nurse, Lisa, was puzzled and asked, who's in room 12? I got up to check and no one was there. I turned off the call light and went back to the nurse's station, but it came back on again. I went back, turned it off, and returned, only for it to come on again. I finally told another CNA that it was her turn to turn it off. She went to do so and then returned to sit down. By then, Lisa, the nurse, suspected that something might have happened to Frank. She made a phone call to the hospital and was told that Frank had died around 7.30 p.m. that evening. We were all freaking out, and when the call light in Frank's room came on two more times, we all went in there to turn it off. The last time it happened, at 10.20 p.m., Lisa and I went into the room together. Lisa said, Frank, you're no longer living here. Please go be with God. You don't live here anymore. After that, the lights stopped turning on. However, there are still nights when some staff members claim they see someone who looks like Frank sitting outside on the dark patio. It was scary, but things like that happened all the time at the nursing home. Story number four. I'm a CNA working in a nursing facility with two wings. One wing is for short-term rehab where patients usually stay for a few days to a few weeks until they get stronger and go home. The other wing is for long-term care, meaning patients usually stay there until they pass away. I know it's not nice to say, but the long-term side can feel like a human dumping ground. These people can no longer care for themselves. They're either too old and weak or have some kind of disease or condition that has left them paralyzed or unable to do activities of daily living. One day, 
A 58-year-old man was sent from the hospital to stay at the nursing facility where I work. This man had been cared for by his family at home, but during the weekdays his kids were at school and his wife had to work, so no one was available to take care of him until they all got home. Whoever arrived home first had to check on him. Because of this, he often ended up lying in his own urine and feces. From his coccyx to his perineal area, his skin was very red and bleeding. The family knew they couldn't care for him adequately, so they decided to place him in the nursing facility. His family visited him almost every day, and his wife spent time with him every weekend. I was talking to his wife one day, and she told me that their daughter, C, was attending a university about two hours away, driving an old Honda Accord. One hot day around 4 p.m., her husband went to put oil in C's car, and he had a stroke while working on it in the driveway. The family inside the house was unaware that he was having a stroke outside. That's how he ended up paralyzed and unable to move his body anymore. I took really good care of this man whenever I worked. He couldn't talk to me, and we only fed him through a tube that was inserted into his stomach. A little over a year later, this patient passed away from a blood infection. He had many wounds on his buttocks, so when he had bowel movements, bacteria would enter his bloodstream, and eventually, he died in the hospital. Their daughter, C., who was attending university, was very kind. She always came to see her father, and I talked to her many times. She's a very smart person. When she texted me that her father had died, she was crying a lot. Seven months after this patient passed away, one night I drove three hours to visit my boyfriend since he lived in another city. He didn't want me to visit him because it's a far drive. Usually my boyfriend is the one that come to see me, but he was having car problems and his car was still at the shop. That night, we went to the movies and had dinner. After that, I dropped my boyfriend off. I was driving home late. My car had been acting funny. It was slow to start, and when I stepped on the gas, it accelerated very slowly. Sometimes the car would shake. I remember driving home, and as I passed a small cowboy town, my car started shaking and moving very slowly, even when I pressed the gas pedal all the way. I was afraid my car might die in the middle of the road, so I pulled over and stopped the car, and then it died and wouldn't start again. I called my boyfriend who never goes to bed until he knows I'm home. He said that he and his older brother would come to get me. My boyfriend doesn't know anything about cars, so he didn't know what was wrong with mine. I was scared, and for some reason, I thought maybe my car had run out of water or coolant. As I saw two cars approaching from a distance and lighting up the road, I decided that I should quickly get out and open the hood to see what was going on. I opened the hood and got out to look at my car. I saw that the coolant was halfway full, so it wasn't that. The two on the other lane drove past me. Just then, I felt something. It was like someone had just entered my car, and the car shook. I stepped to the side and shined my light into the car, but I didn't see anyone. I thought I saw a shadow of someone on the other side of the car, so I beamed my little flashlight through the windows and tiptoed to see who might be there. Just then, the hood of my car closed by itself. It's one of those hoods that requires a stick to hold it up, so I don't know how it closed on its own. I got scared and quickly got inside my car, locking all the doors. Then, at the first twist of the key, my car started again, and I drove away without any problems. After driving for 20 minutes, I exited at a gas station and called my boyfriend to let him know that my car was running fine and that he didn't need to come anymore. I told him I should be home in about an hour. That night when I got home I called my boyfriend to let him know and then I went to sleep. I dreamed that I was at work and the man I used to take care of appeared while I was feeding an elderly patient. He came up to me, handed me a car key and told me that my car's spark plugs were old and not working well, and that I needed to change them. I took the key from him 
and then I woke up. It was a strange dream. Believe it or not, my older sister's boyfriend looked at my car, drove it around, and told me it was the spark plugs. I didn't even know what spark plugs were, but he said they were cheap and he would get some to fix my car. He did, and he explained that spark plugs helped spark the car and make the engine produce power. My car had no issues after that, but I couldn't believe how accurate my dream was. Maybe it wasn't just a dream. Maybe that night the man I cared for came and helped me out. I don't know. It's a scary experience, but it brings me warmth when I think about it. That's all for this video. Thank you for making all the way through and supporting my stories. Have a wonderful day or night.